Chapter 9, Musculoskeletal Disorders. Um, the first part, I'm not going to focus much on it. You can review it anytime if you want to, uh, which is just a normal anatomy that we did, AP1 or AP2. So these are all um, the basics. So musculoskeletal diagnostic test. What should we do to um, diagnose one of the musculoskeletal uh, disorders? And obviously musculoskeletal means muscles and skeleton. So this is, we're talking about muscles and bones. Disorders of the muscles and bones. For the bones, it's usually radiography or bone scanning. Radiography is like x-ray that we all know, just x-ray. Um, bone scanning is something else, and bone scanning is basically um, to scan the density of the bone. This is the most important thing. And if there is something abnormal, it will show up, but it's for density. So if it's less dense, it means it's weak, and so on. For muscles, we have the EMG, which is electromyography. So this is measuring the electrical activities of the muscles. And we can also do biopsy if needed. So EMG can tell you if there is something wrong with the muscles, if it is weak or something. Uh, biopsy, if there is something suspected in the muscle, something like tumor or cancer or any abnormality that need biopsy. Other things, if it is a, a joint or something, you can do arthro, arth, arthroscopy. Arthro means joint, scopy means scope, endoscope. So this is a very tiny uh, endoscope that they enter through the, uh, the joint and visualize what's happening inside. If there is something eroded or if there is something broken down, meniscus or something like that. MRI. Uh, can do specifically the soft tissue, it can show, and then examination of the fluid. Most likely they, they put like a needle or something and they take a sample of the fluid and examine it. They can examine it for anything. Can examine it for any abnormalities, infection, anything that's abnormal. So the first abnormality that we're going to talk about is the fracture. And fracture can be complete, means you have one, one bone become two pieces. Like the humerus, it's broken down and you, now you have two pieces. It's not partially or something. Incomplete is partial broken bone. So the bone is still one, but there is breakdown in that uh, bone. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the fracture can be called open or closed, depending on the skin. So you can actually have a broken bone, but the skin is fine, okay? If it is opened, this is, if it is, the skin is broken, you, say you call it open, sometimes you call it compound fracture. Uh, so complete, incomplete, open, closed. Uh, the simple fracture is when the alignment is sustained, meaning like this. If this is a bone and it is broken down like this, the alignment is still there. If it is lost the alignment like this, they have to realign, okay? So, is it simple, uh, broken, meaning the alignment is there, or it is multiple broken and the, the bones are moving around, changing the alignment, and this is community fracture. It's basically community fracture will have pieces, okay? It's not like one bone become two. No, it's one bone become two and some fractures different uh, small fractures. Compression fracture, on the other hand, is when the bone collapsed or crushed. And the most, and the most uh, common example is compression fracture of the vertebrae, of the vertebral column. Like you see some people, older people specifically, they say uh, they are becoming shorter. If you ever heard about this. They are a little bit shorter because the, vert the vertebra are being compressed. Okay, compressed, because uh, the, the vertebra becoming weak, and this is compressed fracture. There are other types, something like pathological, because there is a problem with the bone. It's not just trauma, uh, stress fracture. Stress fracture is it's also called fatigue fracture, and this is basically not a real fracture. 
Some people, when they, they play something strenuous exercise or they play something like football or soccer or something for a long time, they feel pain in the bone, but there is nothing that's really broken. It's a mini fracture that's called stress fracture. Depressed fracture is something like in the skull when the fracture causes depression and it can actually go all the way to the brain. So the first thing that's going to happen when we have a fracture is inflammation and then bleeding. The blood goes to the fractured area and then some edema will occur, pain obviously, blood clotting. So there is hematoma. Then fibroblasts are going to start to put some collagen. Chondroblasts will, will start some uh, cartilage formation. And then you have something called procallus. The procallus is fibrous color. Um, if you ever got fractured before or something, if you feel specifically like something in the, uh, like the tibia, if you have a fracture here and you feel, you feel something bumpy, you feel something that's swollen, or the bone is is not all flat. This area specifically that's broken recently, it's bumping a little bit. It's protruding. This is called the procallus. Um, and the procallus is going to change to become callus and then will become, um, it will change to, bro to bony callus and then remodeling. And usually, practically speaking, what's happening is at the beginning, this is the procallus and then the procallus will become bone. So you have this elevation of the bone, something like this. This is a bone and you have a fracture here. The procallus will be like this. It would change and become bone from inside and outside. This will stay for some time. You can feel it. And then it will reduce, reduce. Most of the time, it's not, it will not go back as it, as it used to be. It usually doesn't go like flat, completely flat. It will reduce but usually it will leave some remnants. So we have hematoma, inflammation, hematoma, you have pain, and then you reform the bone, procallus, callus, and then remodeling. This is how we heal uh, the bone. Healing can be different from person to person, depend on the amount of damage. Uh, is it proximal to the bony ends or, or uh, or far away from it. Uh, if there is infection or foreign material, if there is something that's in there or infected with something, obviously it will take more time. Does it have good blood supply? The systemic factor, something like if this person was getting fracture, is he old, is he young? Or, or, or um, uh, nutritional factors, if he is malnourished or well nourished and so on. So people, you hear people, um, the same fracture, you take two months, they take six months, and so on. So this depends on different factors. Some of them are systemic. When the, when the, when the bone is fractured, there are complications that, complications that can occur. Muscle spasm is one of them. The muscles around the bone will become spastic to protect the bone, basically. It can get infected, specifically if it's an open fracture. And we know that the open fracture is skin is broken, right? It's open to the outside. So it can get infected. Ischemia, if something happened that close or restrict the blood supply, it can lead to ischemia. Fat embolism, this is something specifically known for pelvic fracture, specifically for older people. If you ever heard about uh, grandma, she fell down in the bathroom. It was not something huge. Just fell down in the bathroom and her pelvis become fractured for some reason. A couple of weeks or something later, she have a pulmonary problem. She's not breathing well. What's the relationship between the bone and breathing? This is fat embolism. The fat that's around the pelvic area when the fracture occur, maybe a small piece of fat enter to the circulation and go to the lung, causing fat embolism. Sometimes you can damage the nerve that's supplying the area. That's why if somebody's having a fracture, it's not just the bone. Everything in the area should be examined. Is the blood supply going? Is fine. Or is it ischemic? Do we have infection? Is the nerve fine? So right after that, move your foot. Move forward. Move backward. So they have to test sensation. Do you feel here? 
So they have to make sure that the nerve is not damaged, the blood supply is not affected, and so on. It can lead to something like osteoarthritis later on, you have, if, especially if it is closer to the, to the joint. Okay? So these are the complications. Treatment, obviously, reduction. This is the treatment. Reduction means you put it back. It can be closed uh, reduction, meaning you just restore it and you don't have to do surgery or open it. And they do it basically like this. They stretch, if, if there is a fracture here, for example, they stretch, they align the bone, and then they do the cast. They didn't open the skin, they didn't do surgery, inside surgery or anything. They just do a closed reduction, and this is most of the time. If there is another, if, if, if this is more complicated than that, they can actually open and do a surgery. Alignment, sometimes they use pins or screws or plates or something. And this is if they cannot do the closed fracture, uh, closed reduction. So obviously the closed reduction is the treatment of choice. Usually they try to do it, avoiding surgery, but if they have to, they will do it. There is a syndrome that's called compartment syndrome. And basically, what we need to know here is compartment syndrome means you're interfering with the blood supply for some reason. You have a fracture here, for example, you put the cast. The cast, common sense, it's not supposed to be too tight or too loose, right? It should be just around the bones. If it is too tight, it will interfere with the blood supply. This is compartment syndrome. If the blood supply is inter interfered with, if they interfere with the blood supply, it will cause ischemia, edema, and it can actually lead to gangrene. So all of this is a complication of tight, specifically tight. If it is too loose, it will cause misalignment, but this is something else. So if we're talking about specifically about the compartment syndrome, means this compartment that have the cast, the cast was too tight, interfering with the blood supply, specifically. And it can lead to ischemia, edema, dead tissue, gangrene, and if gangrene happen, amputation, unfortunately. Uh, gangrene equals amputation. Dislocation. Dislocation means separation of two bones at the joint, like this. This is the most frequent dislocation. We all hear about shoulder dislocation, right? This is the most common dislocation. Why? Why this specifically? We always hear shoulder dislocation. Most mobile, this is one. And because the joint is too shallow. Uh, it's ball and socket, but it's like this. The, 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 the equivalent of the shoulder is the pelvic uh, bone, but it's a ball and socket, real ball and socket. Do you remember how the femur head looks like? It goes inside like this. It's, it's very hard to, to dislocate. But this, the glenoid cavity is too shallow. So it's very easy because it's very mobile. This is the most mobile one. And because the glenoid cavity of the scapula is very shallow. So we can easily dislocate. But generally speaking, dislocation means separation of two bones at a joint. And they have to restore it. The treatment is put it back. Actually, some people have very frequent dislocation and they actually realign themselves. Did you ever see this? You do it? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, there are some people, if you get that frequently, it means that the ligaments are kind of a little bit weak or, or stretching, over stretchable. So they just do it like this and realignment and just put it back. Yeah, I, I, saw, I saw it different times. Do, like it happened playing soccer or something and this is dislocated. Oh, should, should we call 911? Should we do something? Oh, no, no, just wait. Here it is. <laughs> Just like that. And, and it, if you get used to it, just put it back. It, and it's simple to put it back, by the way. Not something like the, the pelvis or, or the, uh, the knee joint or something. So, uh, and if that's the case, the treatment, if, if you are putting it back or something, but it can be complicated. So sometimes they, need, they can do surgery. And surgery, they either make the ligaments shorter or sometimes they fix the bones together somehow. Not completely fixing, they just attach the bones together. So this is surgery. What's the most important about, thing about dislocation? What does it mean? Okay, dislocation, separation of two bones at a joint. Treatment, put it back. This is the most uh, frequent one.
What's a sprain versus strain? We hear those. Strain is the ligament is torn, tear in the ligament. Strain, tear in the tendon. Do we, under, do we, do we remember the difference between ligament and tendon? Ligament is attachment between two bones. Tendon is attachment between muscle and bone. This is most likely. Okay, there are other cases, but most likely. Tendon is something like this. Biceps, if you follow the biceps, it will take you to a tendon. So this is tendon. Tendon attach muscle to bone. Ligament attach bone to bone. If the, if the ligament is torn, you call it sprain. If the, if the tendon is torn, you call it strain. This is different than avulsion. Avulsion is not torn, not partial torn. So if this is happening, something like this, for example. If this is a ligament and it's torn, it will be torn like this. Okay? So you still have the main part like this, just this part is torn. Okay? Ligament, tendon, strain and strain. If you cut it like this, this is avulsion which is complete separation. You cut it into two pieces. And the treatment of any one of those is just immobilization. They can, they can use something like hanging, um, uh, they can uh, uh, use like something like uh, shoulder support, something li like to keep it in place, don't move it and it will, the, usually it will heal by itself. If it is like this, if it is just a, a sprain or strain, if it's avulsion, they usually suture it. So what's a sprain and what's a strain? Sprain ligaments, strain tendons. Evulsion is complete. There are other, um, other joint diseases, something like muscle tear uh, and so on. Muscle tear, if the muscle is torn, it can be one of the three degrees, first, second, or third. First degree means just a little bit, small percentage, small piece, percentage of muscle fibers are involved. Second, a lot of muscle fibers are involved, torn. Third, the muscle is cut. The muscle is, too, is a completely cut. You cut it into two pieces, basically. Okay, so this is a tear across the width of the muscle. So first degree, second degree, and third degree. Uh, usually if something happens in the joints, they use the rice, which is rest, immobilization, compression, elevation. This is something like ABC. Anything happen to the joints, just do rice and then go from there. So rice, rest, immobilization, compression, elevation. And then other things can be used, something like NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, something like uh, ibuprofen, Advil, not, not Tylenol. This, this is more toward ad, something contain ibuprofen rather than acetaminophen. Something like Advil, um, what was the other one? Uh, okay. Motrin, which is, which is the same thing. Advil and Motrin are the same. Both of them exactly the same. Same dose of ibuprofen. Uh, physiotherapy to make the muscles stronger and so on. Bone disorders can be primary, so it's happening from the uh, bone itself, or it can be secondary, meaning it's happening from somewhere else and it reflects on the bones. And this is, by the way, is always the case. When you hear primary and secondary disorder, Anywhere, not just in the bone. Primary mean it's happening from the region itself. Primary disorder of the humerus is something happening in the humerus. Something started in the humerus. Secondary means some, something happened somewhere else and it's reflect on the bone. Osteoporosis. Osteo means bone. Porosis means porous. So osteoporosis means porous bone. And basically, if you still remember the, the, the balance between the two types of bone cells, do you guys still remember this? The osteoblast versus osteoclast, the bone former and the bone breaker, right? There is always a balance between those two. If the, the osteoclast is 
more active, then the osteoblast, then the bone will become weaker. And which means bone resorption is more than bone formation. Osteoclast is taking the upper, the upper hand. It's not supposed to. There's supposed to be a balance between osteoblast and osteoclast. Osteoclast, take the upper hand, meaning bone resorption. Resorb means you take the calcium away. So bone resorption will exceed the bone formation. And this is osteoporosis. Um, and anytime, anytime you hear that the bone is becoming weaker, you have to, to, to do something to estimate the density, which is called the density scan or the bone scan that we mentioned in the beginning, right? The, the, the density scan will, will tell you that this bone is less dense for a reason. So less dense means resorption. And uh, osteoporosis is more likely to happen in females. Why? Females after menopause, specifically. Why? Estrogen. estrogen, yes. Estrogen, both estrogen and testosterone, both of them make the bone harder, strong. After menopause, it will become weaker. Okay. So basically, estrogen and testosterone, they augment the function of the osteoblast. Are we following so far? It activates the osteoblast more. You don't have it, the osteoblast goes down, the osteoclast will take the upper hand, and the bone will become weaker. Resorption. So most likely, um, it's after 50, because this is the age of menopause. Um, the other thing is sedentary life, okay? Or decreased mobility, meaning uh, somebody is staying in the hospital for a couple of months, not, not moving around, not doing any activity, so they can end up getting osteoporosis even if they don't have another problem. So sedentary life, hormones, estrogen and, and uh, testosterone specifically, um, corticosteroid and parathyroid hormone. If those two are increased, that will, that will lead to bone weakness and osteoporosis. Corticosteroid is the cortisone. And I think we, we, we hear about the side effects of cortisone. This is one of them. It makes the bone weak. Cortisone. Resorption. The other thing is, if you're not getting what you need, what do you need to make your bone strong? You need calcium. You need proteins. What's the bone in the first place? Prote the, the, the bone is protein. You put calcium and phosphate on it, it will become bone. So you need the protein. You need the calcium and phosphate. And you need the vitamin D to help you with the calcium. If you don't have one of those, you will have, you will have this problem, okay? Uh, cigarette smoking and caffeine, yes, but it's more important to remember those, okay? Immobility or decreased mobility, this is one, sedentary life. Hormones, cortisone, including cortisone, so estrogen, testosterone, and cortisone, parathyroid, and deficiency of one of the three that are needed for the bone. Protein, vitamin D, and calcium. Or protein, calcium, and vitamin D. How about phosphate? Phosphate is needed in small amount and we usually don't have uh, phosphate deficiency. If you have deficiency, it's usually calcium. Most likely. Treatment, weight, bearing, exercise. If you're deficient, if you have deficiency in something, eat it. You don't eat enough calcium, eat enough calcium. You don't eat enough protein, eat enough protein. You don't have enough vitamin D, get vitamin D. So this is the dietary modification. But weight-bearing exercise is important. Because when you exercise, not only your muscles will become stronger, but your bone also becomes stronger. So those who are um, weightlifters or uh, muscle builders or something, they will, the muscles will become big and bulky, but the bone itself, okay? So weight bearing exercise. And that's why if somebody is in the hospital or something and they know they, it will, he will stay or she will stay for a long time, they tell them, irrespective, even if you're sick and tired, you can't move, you have to move. Even walk around, right? We always see that. Walk around even in the hospital, in your room, around the room. You have to walk around. 
because when you use your bones, your body will keep it. If you don't use your bone, your body will assume that you don't need your bone anymore, right? And the body will simply take the calcium, use it somewhere else. So the bone will become weaker. So there are other things, obviously. Calcitonin, which is the opposite of the parathyroid. Do, do you guys remember the, the function of the parathyroid and why parathyroid makes the bones weak? What does it do? Parathyroid hormone. What's the function of parathyroid? What's the relationship between parathyroid hormone and calcium? Does it increase calcium in the blood or decrease it? How about calcitonin? Both of them decrease? Do you guys remember something like that? Calcitonin decrease and parathyroid increase in the blood. I'm talking about calcium, I'm not talking about the bone. The bone is it's the opposite. So what's the function of the parathyroid hormone? Increase calcium in the blood. What's the function of calcitonin? Decrease calcium in the blood. When you say increase calcium in the blood, you take it from the bone to the blood, and the bone will become weaker. When you say calcitonin decrease it from the blood, means it take it from the blood to the bones, and the bones will become stronger. Did you get the idea why you reduce parathyroid, increase calcitonin? Because it, it does exactly the opposite. Here is the blood, and here is the bone. And the calcium should be in both of them, right? You take it from the blood to the bone, you will have low calcium in the blood, but the bone will become strong. If you take the calcium from the bone to the blood, it will increase in the blood, but the bone will become weak. Did you get the idea? There is always a balance between those two. And the balance is by parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Parathyroid, take it from the bone to the blood. Calcitonin, take it from the blood to the bone. Okay? Rickets versus osteomalacia. Both of them means the bone is weak. Okay? Bone is weak in both cases. What's the difference then? Rickets basically is vitamin D deficiency in kids. Osteomalacia, same thing in adults. I think we all heard about rickets, right? Rickets, you don't, the, the kids don't have enough vitamin D. What is the importance of vitamin D? It helps absorption of calcium, right? You don't have enough vitamin D, you don't absorb enough calcium, your bone will become weak, right? So this is basically the same, but this is in rickets, is in kids, osteomalacia is in adults, okay? So and th that explains, if you heard about, uh, your, they always say, do not keep your kids indoors all the time. They have to be exposed to the sun, right? Why? because this is how you activate and make vitamin D. Otherwise, if the kids stay indoors for a long time, they, become, they get triggered. What's the most important thing to know here? Rickets and osteomalacia. Rickets, vitamin D deficiency in kids. Osteomalacia, vitamin D deficiency in adults. In both cases, the bone is weak. Paget's disease, destruction of the bone, and the bone become and replace it by fibrous tissue. Paget's disease. Destruction of the bone, replace it by fibrous tissue. Okay, and this can cause pathologic fracture. Osteomyelitis, infection of the bone. Infection of the bone. Infection by what? Usually bacteria. Sometimes fungus. So obviously the treatment will be antibiotics, right? Osteomyelitis. Abnormal curvature. Lordosis versus kyphosis and scoliosis. Lordosis, the word lordosis is coming from lords. Lords means in England, like um, something like, uh, uh, like the Congress or something. Those people in the, in the ancient time, they used to go like this. Like they are superior people, they are very important, so they walk like this. Okay, kyphosis is like this, okay? Scoliosis is side by side, something like this, okay? So kyphosis, lordosis, like a lord, and scoliosis is side by side. 
Tumors, I think you guys should be familiar with uh, osteoma versus osteosarcoma. Which one of those is malignant? Sarcoma, osteosarcoma. So osteosarcoma is the most common primary neoplasm in the bone. Um, what's the warning sign? The sort of warning sign? Bone pain during rest. You have a pain and you're not doing anything. You don't have pain because you're uh, exercising, you, you have like a fracture or you have something, there's nothing happening. You're just do, not doing anything and you have uh, bone pain. This is how osteosarcoma looks like. Other tumors, chondrosarcoma, Chondrosarcoma, is that benign or, or malignant? Hmm? Malignant of what? Chondro? Cartilage. So cartilage, malignant cancer of the cartilage. Ewing sarcoma is another uh, malignant tumor in the bones, but it's more in younger people. Metastasis, if that metastasize means send secondaries, usually goes to the lung. Secondaries to the lung, or metastasis to the lung. Um, treatment, just take it as a rule. Treatment of any cancer is surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, right? Just take it like this. So, and you don't know which is which because this is too much uh, in depth. So let's just call it like this. Surgery, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy of anything. Muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy means the muscles will become dystrophic. And dystrophic means degenerate, degeneration, dystrophy. This means difficulty. Difficult to grow, meaning uh, the muscles will become degenerated. So muscular dystrophy is degeneration. There are, there is something called Duchenne muscular dystrophy and pseudo-hypertrophic muscular dystrophy. These are the most common ones, Duchenne and pseudo-hypertrophic. And um, the, the pseudo-hypertrophic is one of, uh, or, or basically what's happening here is sometimes you see people that looks like, you think they are very strong, the muscles are big, and they are very weak. If you just push them, they don't have power. So this is dystrophy. It's not, it, or pseudo hypertrophy. They, 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 don't have, they, they don't have muscles big because they are, they are exercising. It's something pathological. It's becoming larger, but not strong. Um, so this will basically cause weakness. This is one. There is a maneuver that's called the goer maneuver. Push up to erect position. Goers maneuvers like this. You will tell the patient to stay like this and go and stand, stand up like this. They will have a really difficult time going up. Okay? Because the muscles, even though the muscles look good, sometimes looks bigger than normal, but the muscles are very weak. If that extended to other parts, it can lead to problems in the lungs and heart. Diagnosis. Genes, this is something genetic of, of, or have genetic origin. Creatinine kinase, what's a creatinine kinase? Creatinine kinase is one of the, of the most important enzyme in the muscles. And it should stay in the muscles, inside. If you see it increasing in the blood, means the muscles are broken. Okay, the muscles are injured. You get what I mean? The muscle fibers are just cells, right? So the muscle fibers contain creatinine kinase inside. If you break it down, you're releasing creatinine kinase. So if it is increased, it means there is a problem with the muscles. Uh, they can do also um, the, e, uh, the EMG, electromyograph, and this is what we mentioned before. Uh, muscle biopsy can give us some idea. And there is something called dystrophin, which is a blood test. If they find dystrophin, it's coming from dystrophy. Dystrophin is coming from dystrophy. Okay, so this can uh, tell us that there is a muscular dystrophy. There, unfortunately, treatment, there is no cure for this. It's, it's usually have genetic rules, but they help them to function, basically. So some exercise to maintain the motor function, for example. They give them different appliances, some supports of their joints, 
some support of their muscles and so on. Physiotherapy. Uh, if they cannot breathe because of the muscles are too weak, they can use some ventilators. Fibromyalgia. 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 What does it mean? Algia means... What's algia? Algia means... What's analgesic means? Analgesic. If you're taking a medication, that's analgesic. Painkiller. Pain so, analgesia, no pain. So, algia means pain. Fibro, my algia means muscle pain with fibrosis. Just translation. Fibro, my algia. Fibromyalgia. Okay. So that's a, a, a that's um, a pain in the muscles with some fibrosis. It, so that will, 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 will cause pain, stiffness, okay? Plus some psychological problems, including sleep disturbances and anxiety. So it's two components, okay? Pain, stiffness from one side, sleep disturbances and anxiety, sometimes depression, okay? Two parts, physical part and psychological part. This is fibromyalgia. Pain, stiffness from one side, sleep disturbances, and anxiety or depression. Uh, they say it's, it's related to serotonin or substance B. Are we familiar with the serotonin? Serotonin. It's, serotonin is one of the neurotransmitters that's responsible for feeling good, and responsible for helping you to sleep. They said there's a disturbances in this. These are theories, but the most important thing to, to remember about fibromyalgia is pain, stiffness, sleep, disturbances, and an anxiety or depression. Treatment, obviously you're treating the two problems. You have pain, stiffness, you have sleep disturbance and anxiety. Take medication for sleep to help you sleep. Take medication for depression or anxiety. This is one part. For the other part, you can take analgesics or uh, plus some exercise that will help the muscles to uh, keep its uh, motor abilities. There is a new drug that's called Lyrica. If you ever heard about this, Lyrica is helping the depression and helping the pain as well. Larica. Joint disorders. Osteoarthritis. Uh, when you hear about osteoarthritis, this is not a really good name. They change it now because it's, it doesn't really make sense. Osteoarthritis means, what's itis? Inflammation. So this is basically you're saying this is inflammation of the bone and joints. It's not really inflammation. It is degeneration. So, but, so right now, but we will stick with whatever we have in the slides. But now they call it more DGD, degenerative joint disease, because it's not really inflammation. There is no inflammation. There might be some inflammation as a consequence of uh, the degeneration. But simply, the very simple way, this is a bone an end of the bone, and this is the end of the other bone, right? So this is a joint. There is a cartilage covering this one, and covering cartilage covering this one. When this cartilage is eroded, or degenerate, osteoarthritis. Degeneration of the cartilage. So this is more in older people. Uh, it has some genetic uh, factor because this is a, a 60 years old male, and this is a 60 years old male, they are doing the same thing, but this one get it, this one doesn't get it. So obviously there is some genetic factor, factors. So most important thing to remember about osteoarthritis is bone, I mean cartilage, degeneration. Degeneration of the articular cartilage. The cartilage is degenerated, okay? If you look at this picture, this is the pathophysiology that we need to know. So. After some time, there will be some cysts 
osteophytes or bone spurs, meaning the bone grow in a weird way, so that when they move, they start to feel the pain. Erosion of the cartilage and bone, this is the most important thing. Okay, so erosion of the cartilage, the space will become narrower, so this is the most important part, erosion of the cartilage. The cartilage is degenerated and eroded. Plus, osteophytes and cysts. So this is usually related to abusing your joint. Just think about it this way. You're abusing your joint, meaning you are playing something that's very strenuous, you are obese, so you're overweight, you're abusing your joint somehow. Sometimes it comes from trauma, some people, some, some younger people can have it if they are um, having trauma or repetitive use, soccer player that, that, that are playing very, um, uh, soccer in a very hard way, they are not just playing normal, they are very rough in playing, so they abuse your joints. So basically, in one word, you're abusing the joint somehow, specifically the knee, abusing the joint. Overweight, you're abusing your joint with the weight, or um, repetitive trauma or something like that, aging player rule. And most importantly, it, it is, what's happening here is pain decreased mobility. Most important thing to remember. The joints are painful and less mobile or less mobile, okay? So those people will walk like this in their age. They can't really move much. The range is less and it's painful. Okay, so get the most important part. Pain plus limitation of mobility, movement limitation. Treatment, there is no curative treatment. So I never heard of a person, an elderly person who have osteoarthritis and he, he got treatment and he's fine now. But usually, unfortunately, that's not the case. So basically, they help them a little bit um, mild exercise, uh, they give them some support, braces, uh, orthotics sometimes, like shoes or something, massage, physiotherapy, uh, analgesics, anti-inflammatory medications. Sometimes they have to uh, stab uh, uh, stabilize the joint, arthrotomy, um, if it is in the final case, meaning an elderly person who is trying different types of treatment, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, braces, mild exercise, they are trying all of this, but the pain is disabling. If that's the case, they replace the knee, the replacement, okay? There, there is something called glucosamine chondrite or chondroitin sulfate or glucosamine chondroitin uh, or hyaluronic acid, this and this, this is a supplement that they sell it in uh, nutritional stores, store, stores that sell like vitamins, vitamin store, if you heard about this. So they sell something like that, and this can help replacing the fluid, replacing the cartilage, but the problem is it's very slow to heal, very slow to rebuild, so most likely I never heard of one patient who's using it. Usually, well, we tell the patients you have to, to stay on it for years. They usually use it for a couple of months and then it's not doing anything. It's not doing anything, it will not. It takes really long time, a couple of years until you start to see, to see some effect, okay? Rheumatoid arthritis, this is an autoimmune disorder and autoimmune means, auto means self, so this is immunity against your own joints, basically. This is more in uh, women, in females. And what's happening here is the synovial membrane become inflamed, synovitis. Panis formation, and panis means the membranes become thicker. Fibrosis and ankylosis, and ankylosis means stuck together. Ankylo means stuck together. 
So the, the, the two bones become stuck together. Synovitis, penis formation, cartilage erosion, fibrosis and ankylosis. So if you look at this picture, synovitis, inflammation of the joint. As you see here, the membrane is becoming thicker, which is penis. Cartilage starts to lose it. Fibrous tissue starts to replace. It will, the fibrous tissue will fix the two bones together, causing ankylosis. So these are the pathological changes that happen with rheumatoid arthritis. This is um, a complicated or a late case of rheumatoid arthritis. It's called proteinier's deformity. We covered the basics, but this is just for you to know if you want to. So if you see somebody like this, they can't actually straighten their, um, their hand or their fingers. It will cause deformity like this. So this is a late case of rheumatoid arthritis. It's an autoimmune disease, and these are the changes that occur. We'll have some other systemic effects. Uh, the one that's worth mentioning is depression and iron deficiency anemia. These are, this is something that can happen at the systemic effect. It has genetic factors and obviously um, the signs and symptoms, pain, stiffness, just like any other joint, any, just take it as a rule, any joint disease will cause pain and stiffness. This is, this is always the case. But in this case, because of the, uh, this severe inflammation, there will be some redness and swelling of the joints. And it usually includes the small joints. And usually it's bilateral. What do we mean by that? Meaning, if there is an inflammation of the knee, most likely it's not rheumatoid arthritis. It's osteoarthritis. So it's, it's, it's inflaming joints like this like in the hand, okay? Most likely. Small joints and it's usually bilateral, meaning I have a pain here and here, here and here, okay? It's bilateral and symmetrical. So we have the same problem in the right and left sides, okay? Treatment, rice, for just like anything else, they give them some NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, glucocorticoid, and there are some factors that are called the DMARD or the disease-modifying antiarthritic drugs, something like gold sulfate, methotrexate or biological response modifiers, which is called the BRMs, um, like in Fleximab or, or others. Juvenile Rheumatoid arthritis, this is just juvenile means younger. So this is more acute form that occur uh, prematurely. So the onset is more acute than the adult form. And it can affect the large joints. This is the only difference. Okay? But this is uh, not the common variant. There are different forms of juvenile, but this is good enough to remember. Um, Infectious arthritis means inflammation of the joints due to infection. So it's called also, also called septic arthritis. And this is usually a single joint. Remember this. Infection, it's how often do you think both knees will be infected? I mean, it's usually one joint will be affected. You have a trauma or something and it's opened. So infection get in there. But how often can you see it bilateral? Extremely rare. So infection is usually bilateral, and most likely it is a large joint, okay? This is different from rheumatoid arthritis, which is bilateral, small joints, and different than osteoarthritis, which is in the, in the weight-bearing joints. Are we following the differences? How to differentiate between these diseases? Osteoarthritis, weight-bearing joints, large joints, bilateral. Rheumatoid arthritis, Small joints, bilateral, and it's autoimmune. Infectious is usually unilateral, and small, more in 
uh, larger joints. So since this is infection, so the most likely it's bacteria, antibiotic. And because it's infection, so any infection you should see redness, swelling, uh, uh, pain. If you remember redness, swelling, and pain, this is the case for any infection. Just take it as a rule. Anywhere in the pathophysiology. When you hear infection, automatically, remember the last time you got infected somewhere. It's always red, warm, swollen, and painful. Isn't that inflammation always happen like this? Did you get infected before and you see how inflammation looks like? Right? Redness, usually swollen, painful. Okay? And this is the case for any infection. Gout. Gout is, or gouty arthritis. What's the gout? Uric acid deposit in the joints. What's the uric acid? The uric acid is a product of breaking down proteins. You break down proteins or nucleic acid, you end up getting some uric acid. What normally happens is you break down nucleic acid or proteins, you produce uric acid you lose it in the urine, and that's normal, okay? We, every day, we eat meat, right? Break it down, produce uric acid, get rid of it in the urine. This is normal. What if, what if, you cannot get rid of it in the urine because a problem in your kidney, or you're overproducing uric acid? Examples? You're eating a lot of, specifically, red meat. Red meat produces more uric acid than the white meat. So if you're eating a lot of it, this can help. How about this? What if you're taking a medication that breaks down your own muscles? Isn't that protein too? Your muscles is protein, isn't it? So you're, you're breaking down your own muscles because of a medication. So this is the idea. So uric acid somehow you produce it, either you overproduce it or you under it. Are we following so far? Normally we, we produce uric acid and get rid of it in the urine. That's normal. If you overproduce it, you're overloading your blood, overloading your kidney, it will accumulate. Or under secretion, your kidney was not able to get rid of it. In both cases, uric acid accumulate in the blood. If it accumulates in the blood, it will start to go to the joint, go to the joint, start inflammation because of that. Did you get the, the gout? And the gout, you used to call it the disease of the kings or the disease of the royal family. And that's because in ancient ages or in uh, though this time, these times, older times, um, they, um, the royal family is the one that eats red meat consistently. Every day they eat meat, a lot of meat. And other people are really poor, so they don't get really get enough. So that's why it's, it, it's used to be, okay? Uh, called the royal, the disease of the royal family, for example, or disease of the kings, because of a lot of red meat. Now everybody obviously eats meat, so anybody can get it. So did you get the idea? Uric acid accumulates in the blood, gold deposit in the joints, starting an inflammation process. This is the uh, urate crystals. These are the crystals that actually accumulate in the joints. And obviously, because inflammation started, what are the signs of inflammation? Redness, swollen, pain, warm a little bit, hot a little bit. Okay, so this is what's happening. So what's the treatment? Treatment, if you understand the reason, deal with it. You're having uric acid accumulating. Reduce it somehow. Reduce uric acid. Okay? How to reduce uric acid? Don't eat a lot of red meat. This is one. If, there's a kid, if, the, if the kidney needs treatment, treat the kidney. If you're taking medication that breaks down your muscles, don't take the medication that's breaking down your muscles. It, this is the simple way. Um, blood test should show uric acid increased, obviously. 
And if anybody's doing a blood test for gout, they shouldn't take any of the NSAIDs. Because if you take NSAIDs, it will give you uh, false negative results. So you have gout, deric acid is a lot. You take NSAIDs, you go do, do a blood test, uh, you're fine, you don't have gout. This is false negative. So they always, if somebody is coming for blood test, you tell them, do not take any of these medications, NSAIDs. Ankylosing spondylitis. Spondyl means vertebra. Ankylosing, ankylo, which we talked about it before, stuck together. So ankylosing spondylitis means inflammation of the vertebra and stuck together. Okay? The, the name makes sense? Ankylosing spondylitis. Spondylitis. Spondyl or spondy, it means vertebra. Itis Inflammation. So inflammation of the vertebra and become ankylosis. Means stuck together. Inflammation of the vertebra, they stuck together. This is ankylosing spondylitis. This is a progressive inflammatory disease, specifically, specifically affecting the sacroiliac joint. Do you remember this joint in the pelvis? Between the sacrum and uh, the ilium, the iliac bones to pelvic bones and the sacrum. So this joint or the joint in between the vertebra, this part is usually affected, ankylosing spondylitis. They say it's autoimmune, it's genetic, but it's unknown. We don't know much about it. Um, but the unique thing about ankylosing spondylitis is morning stiffness. Those people will say, I wake up in the morning having pain. And when I start to move, I have pain and limited mobility. Later on, half an hour later or something, I'm fine. So it usually goes like this, okay? Ankylosing spondylitis. So the, uh, so the joints are inflamed, which is spondylitis, what it, what it means. Ankylosing means fusion. They fuse together. It can cause osteoporosis. But it's basically, most important thing is, Low back pain and stiffness early in the morning that disappear later on. Uh, there is nothing much to be, to be done. They just give them NSAIDs, non-steroidal, something for the pain, exercise, physiotherapy, which is nothing much. And look at this picture. This is typical of ankylosing spondylitis. Notice this. This is, this is a straight line, right? So the curvature is lost. Why? Because the, the, the vertebra fused together. So it become like this. This is a straight line, and they become kyphotic a little bit. Okay? This is the posture for ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, other inflammatory disease uh, pr uh, problems, bursitis is inflammation of the bursae. I don't know if you guys remember the bursa. Or not? Uh, bursa is basically something in the joints. So this is a joint, this is a bone, and this is the other bone, like this. You have like pockets like these that contain fluid just to minimize the friction between the two bones. If that's inflamed, bursitis, synovitis, inflammation of the synovial membrane of the joints, synovitis, tendonitis, inflammation of the tendons, obviously when anything is inflamed, it becomes painful, swollen, and so on. So that's it for this part.